I'm sure all of you are familiar with that feeling you get when you hear a classic piece of music from a game you grew up with, and you're suddenly flooded with an array of emotions. It almost seems like with one track, the entire experience flashes before your eyes. You remember the room you used to sit in when you played it, the friends you had at the time, the excitement you felt as you put the cartridge or disc in the console not knowing what you were in for, and how you were moved while witnessing the story's most impactful moments for the first time. Suikoden isn't even a game I grew up with. I played it for the first time 10 or so years ago in my early 20s. Yet, when I hear certain tracks from the OST, I get that feeling, almost as if I had played it when I was nine years old. It's a game that accomplished something truly rare, a special combination of brilliance that's almost impossible to describe, where every aspect of the game comes together and complements each other in just the right way, that inexplicable it factor. In a time where Nintendo had dominated the JRPG landscape for years with the SNES, RPG developers looking to transition from the fourth to the fifth console generation had some tough decisions to make. Nintendo decided they would stick with a ROM cartridge architecture on their upcoming Ultra 64, which would place harsh limitations on expansive RPGs and make them more expensive to produce. For this reason, many third parties moved away from Nintendo to release their games on Sony's disc-based PlayStation, and Suikoden was one of the very first to be seen on that soon-to-be legendary console, especially when it comes to its library of amazing RPGs. However, the PlayStation actually wasn't part of Konami's plans in the beginning. In 1994, Konami was in early development on a gaming machine of their own. It was at this time that Yoshitaka Moriyama, the creator of Suikoden, was assigned to develop an RPG for this secret console. According to him, the original plan was for a home console type machine with card reader functionality, allowing players to exchange data. However, that plan soon changed to a portable type with 3D polygon functionality, basically a Game Boy with 3D graphics. Moriyama was involved with two of three games being developed for this system, the aforementioned RPG as well as a fighting game. The third project was a racing game, but all three were cancelled early in development. The fighting game had about two characters that could be operated to a degree, and the RPG had a playable opening. Since the racing game was being done by another team, my recollection is a bit vague, but I think it was about 20% along in development. None of those titles went on to completion, but the name of the hero's best friend in the RPG I was working on was later reused in Suikoden. That name was Ted. It seems as soon as Konami caught wind of the PlayStation that they decided it was wiser not to enter the crowded hardware market and instead shifted focus to develop games for Sony's console. Because they were now developing for a home console rather than a portable, Moriyama thought it was best to scrap the RPG they had been working on and make a game from the ground up with the PlayStation in mind. The RPG we were planning for Konami's game machine was designed for the purposes of a portable game machine and had a strong emphasis placed on the element of raising characters. More concretely, we had planned for many classes, and players were going to strengthen their characters through repeated class changes. But when we changed to planning for an RPG on the PlayStation, since we were designing for a home console, we decided to place a greater emphasis on the game world, and so we just decided to start over. As he began drawing up concepts for this new game, Moriyama knew he wanted to create a large cast of strong supporting roles, being inspired by manga he was reading where the characters outside of the main hero had lovable personalities and unforgettable designs. These included stories like Captain Tsubasa, Saint Seiya, and Dragon Ball. He also referenced the X-Men as an example of the kind of diverse cast he was hoping to create. I wanted to create a dramatic story with characters like that, so that during the game the players could find the characters they liked. That was the starting point for Suikoden. When the concept was pitched to the executives within Konami, the easiest way to describe what he was going for was to reference a classic Chinese novel called Shui Hu Zuan, which roughly translates to The Outlaws of the Marsh, also known as Water Margin in English and Suikoden in Japanese. Water Margin is a story about 108 outlaws who band together to resist the government, but are eventually granted amnesty and serve the Song Dynasty in their campaigns against rebels and foreign invaders. The higher-ups at Konami loved the idea of basing the game on this concept, which led to the inclusion of the 108 Stars of Destiny in the game. However, Moriyama didn't want the story to stick too closely to the Chinese classic. From an early age, I was a fan of old fables like Suikoden and Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and I was strongly influenced by them to do a multi-character story. However, I decided that a pure Chinese-style worldview was not a good choice for a Japanese RPG with a major fantasy focus, and so it became a half-fantasy, half-Chinese-style worldview. 
For Suikoden 1, I designed some story episodes based to some degree on Suikoden, but since Suikoden 2 was based on the story of Ko and Ryo, I got rather far away from Suikoden. In an interview with the Suikoden Revival Movement Facebook page, he provided more details on his inspirations for the story. We originally didn't plan on the world to be such a big mix of Eastern and Western culture. We wanted to differentiate Suikoden from other RPGs, so we aimed at writing a drama around a large group of characters. This is why we used the story of the Water Margin. However, an RPG that was purely based on Eastern culture would sell well in Japan, but we could hardly call that good. So, we decided to add in some Western fantasy elements. As far as the 27 true runes and the whole battle of chaos versus order is concerned, Michael Moorcock's The Eternal Champion series was a big influence. The idea of the true runes came from a card game in Japan. In this game, you would attach runes to your monsters to give them special abilities in battle. Then, you could change the runes in order to change your monsters' abilities. That was what I used for inspiration. Upon this latest playthrough, one thing I found interesting about Suikoden was the way that Moriyama handled heavier subject matter. The story follows the hero, whom the player can rename but is officially known as Tyr McDull. Tyr is the son of a great general of the Scarlet Moon Empire, who's called away on a mission at the beginning of the game. In the meantime, he leaves his son in the care of his servants, who are tasked to protect him while he begins a military career of his own. During the course of his first assignments, Tyr witnesses the corruption that has spread throughout the Empire, originating with the Emperor himself, and is forced to flee. Having been gifted one of the 27 true runes by his friend Ted, who asks him to keep it safe from the Empire, Tyr is forced to forsake his favored life and go into hiding. He later meets with the leaders of the Liberation Army, who persuade him to join the Resistance, and from there the player recruits those of the 108 characters whom he or she can find, enlisting them to the Rebels' cause as they seek to reform the country. It's a straightforward scenario, but contains a lot of good character subplots that add depth and context to this kind of wartime storyline. Generally speaking, I prefer stories that keep their plots accessible, but make the characters complex and layered, and while Suikoden is definitely written with a younger audience in mind, it does a really good job of introducing characters that can't be painted with a single brush. There are very few characters, even among the Empire's ranks, who you could call truly evil. It was fascinating to me how content that includes chemical warfare, genocide, racism, and patricide, on top of other things you would expect to see among the horrors of war, could be packaged in a way that is completely appropriate for younger audiences, and presents a more nuanced view of morality than is often found in other cartoons kids might be used to. I felt the distinct impression on this playthrough that it would be a perfect introduction to the genre for kids or teenagers who have never played this kind of game before, and decided that if I ever have kids, this would probably be the first JRPG I'd have them play, if they cared to try, of course. Commenting on the nature of the subject matter, and whether or not he ran into any resistance from management over what he should or shouldn't include, Moriyama said the following, Since the story was left up to me, I never directly received any criticism. Since I myself decided to make the theme of it war, I created a story that wouldn't allow people to simply close their eyes to the realities that exist in war. I did not intend to force my own personal views on the player. If players felt anything regarding such issues, I'd like them to decide for themselves how they feel about them." He elaborated on this a bit in his interview with the Suikoden and Revival movement by saying, "...I drew up a vast array of characters of varying social-political backgrounds and creeds, and fleshed out how they would each react in this wartime situation, but anything beyond that is the player's interpretation. With so many factors and multifaceted viewpoints intertwining in a war, I find it impossible to simply label it all as good or evil." There are probably some people who will make the case that the story is too simple, that its writing is rudimentary, and that while the war setting gives some potential for a more profound dive into how people deal with loss and death, that in the end it lacks the depth to truly deliver on that potential. I didn't see it that way myself. I actually found some parallels to classic Disney or Pixar animated films, where it's certainly written with a younger audience in mind, but is also aware and mindful of the parents who take their kids to see those movies. There's a pretty big difference in tone between, say, the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoons and something like Mulan, right? That's more or less how I feel about Suikoden, and the strength of its cast simply can't be ignored. I feel pretty similarly about the gameplay as well. On one hand, if you're an experienced player who has a lot of JRPGs under your belt, there's really no denying how easy and simple Suikoden is, but that doesn't mean it's bad. 
Throughout my playthrough, I found myself wishing it had been my first RPG, because it's perfect as an introduction to what the genre is all about. I think it's also important to look into Moriyama's mindset when balancing the game to understand what he was going for. Ultimately, he wanted Suikoden to be a stress-free experience, and nothing demonstrates this better than how he managed encounter rates. In Suikoden, I was trying to focus on dramatically reducing the player's stress. As an example, for the enemy encounter determination, it's set up so that if you continue in one direction for a certain amount of time, the chances of an enemy encounter go down. This is so that if you're heading for a certain destination, it will be less likely that you encounter an enemy, but if you're wandering around in order to level up, it'll be easier for you to find an enemy. When considering this, the design choices make a lot more sense, and again, it leads me to think that it's a perfect starter JRPG for people who have never played one before. It has pretty much everything you would expect. Turn-based combat, equipment and item management, weapon upgrading, shops, NPCs, side quests, traditional level progression, but it also throws in a few unique ideas to help it stand out. For example, since Suikoden is a wartime story, they introduced this really clever minigame that's meant to simulate large-scale battles. At the core, it's basically just rock, paper, scissors, where charge defeats bow, bow defeats magic, and magic defeats charge. However, depending on which characters you've recruited, you'll also have a few extra options that give you a strategic advantage. For instance, ninja characters can sneak behind enemy lines and report back to you on what the next plan of attack is. Merchants can sway enemies to defect and join your side. And tacticians can strengthen your melee units so that your charges are more powerful. It's a fairly simple but effective abstraction that does a good job of giving the impression of large-scale battles that are a necessary part of the story. And I really liked them. One annoying thing about them, though, is that there is a possibility that your characters can be permanently killed in these battles. Battles that largely hinge on guesswork and chance. And that's never fun. No, what? F that. However, I do like that you can have up to six characters in your active party. Three in the front row and three in the back. Each character fits into either short, medium, or long-range attackers, which determines the enemy row they can hit. Short-range attackers can only reach the row directly in front of them, so if you put them in the back row, they're totally useless. Even when in the front row, though, they can't reach the back of the enemy formation. Medium attackers can hit enemies up to two rows in front of them, allowing them to reach the front and back row of the enemy formation when at the front, and the front row of the enemy formation when in the back. Long-range allies, as is implied, can hit any enemy no matter where they're placed. It's a pretty simple system, but gives the player some consideration when selecting characters for their active party. Magic only becomes available to your characters after you've visited special shops to equip them with runes. Different runes provide different elemental spells, and depending on the magic stat of the character who has the rune equipped, higher level abilities become available. So while characters with a low magic stat will only have access to lower level abilities contained in the rune, Characters with a high magic stat will have access to the higher level abilities. There are also other runes that give your characters really cool Limit Break style attacks, but come with the caveat where it leaves them unbalanced and unable to attack during the next round. Others don't have that penalty applied to them and are just OP, like Valeria's Falcon Rune. There are also certain characters that can unite their turns for special attacks, and a few of these, like Tyr and Kai's Unite ability, can be utilized to inflict major damage to all the enemies in a single turn. I also really appreciated the let go and free will options in the command menu. If you come across a group of enemies that are lower in level than your party, you can simply let them go with a 100% success rate, allowing you to get through battles you have no need to fight really quickly. In battles where the enemies are at an equal level or above, this becomes the run ability, which doesn't have a 100% success rate. Free Will essentially allows your units to attack on their own so that you don't have to give individual commands to everyone. Both of these options allow you to get through battles quickly in sections where you may be overleveled or simply don't need to select special abilities to get through a fight, and it really helps to keep the pace and flow of the game engaging where other JRPGs might start to drag a bit. There are also certain parts of the story where you'll fight one-on-one -on -one battles. Like large-scale battles, this minigame essentially boils down to a rock-paper-scissors mechanic, but after each turn, the enemy will give a line of dialogue that subtly cues you in on what they might be doing next. Again, it's a really simple addition, but does a good job of building the sense of an epic one-on-one -on -one fight, and gives these moments that extra touch of flavor and impact. 
Perhaps the most beloved aspect of Suikoden, however, is the recruiting of the 108 Stars of Destiny, which directly affects your base of operations at Castle Torin, a sort of combination of character collecting and base building all in one. When you first enter the castle, it's empty and run down, but as you recruit characters, the place really livens up, and shops and services become available depending on who you've recruited. For instance, Marie, who ran an inn at the game's first town, will establish an inn at Castle Torn when she's recruited. Other characters will run shops that allow you to equip runes or buy recovery items. Some will allow you to sharpen your weapons or buy equipment, while others give you the opportunity to store items and clear up your inventory. Others still will help you fast travel across the world or upgrade your boat so you can sail faster. So, while you may never use this massive list of characters in your active party, many characters still feel like they have a purpose and are useful to you, which I think is really impressive considering the fact that other games with large casts like this can sometimes have trouble making the majority of their characters feel memorable. It also helps that the character design and art style do a phenomenal job of providing individuality and strong personality to each character. These character portraits are some of the best I've ever seen in the JRPG when it comes to that. The only real complaint I have with the game is its inventory, which is severely limited and cumbersome. Even with six characters in the party, you'll constantly find yourself lacking the space to store new items, and switching items between characters is an unintuitive chore. This is because there isn't a shared inventory, rather each character has their own and can only hold up to nine items apiece. Even if that was the end of it, I wouldn't think much of it. But on top of this, there are certain characters who will leave the party for a while and can take very important items with them. On this playthrough, I made the mistake of giving Victor my blinking mirror, which allows you to fast travel back to Castle Torin. And when he left the party in the story, he took the blinking mirror with him. I'm not the only person to have made this mistake, and it really, really sucks. Aside from that issue, though, there isn't really anything else that I feel is necessary to criticize. It's really solid overall. One thing that shocked me on this playthrough, though, especially considering the fact that I'd played this game before, is how outstanding the soundtrack is. It was composed by Miki Higashino, not a name you hear very often when talking about great video game composers. Her work includes games like Gradius, the 1989 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game, Contra 3, Vandal Hearts, as well as a collaboration with Yasunori Mitsuda on a game called Tsukiyo ni Saraba. Growing up, Higashina was introduced to classical music by her father and was drawn in herself, where she developed a deep love and appreciation for it. However, as is the case with so many of the developers who worked on Golden Age GRPGs, Higashino found herself a bit lost while in college, finding that the program she was enrolled in was focusing too much on music that was antithetical to what she wanted to write, and so she took a part-time job at Konami as an opportunity to work on something she was actually passionate about. On Suikoden in particular, which Moriyama wanted to stand out from other popular RPGs, Higashino took a unique approach. Suikoden is based on one of the most important historical novels of Chinese literature, but the game's towns, cities, and characters span an entire world, with elements of all kinds of cultures, East and West. I realized that it couldn't all be depicted using a single genre of music. On top of that, the game was on a massive scale, and there was no doubt that this world was unlike anything seen before in an RPG. So, I decided to compose something completely different from the music in a Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. The soundtrack definitely encapsulates that expansive feel required for such a large world with different races and cultures, and has the range to express the beauty, excitement, horror, defeat, triumph, and sadness that the characters experience throughout the story. I was especially impressed with Higashino's use of leitmotif on the main theme, taking it from a bold and gallant statement to a soft and greatly sentimental expression. I often find that music is the essential component that brings a scene together and really imprints the emotional impact on the audience. Tetsuya Takahashi shared a similar sentiment when talking about his experience in creating Xenogears, where he felt a pressing fear that the story was simply not conveying what he had hoped until Yasunori Mitsuda's music was put in place. I would say the same is true here. Without such a brilliant soundtrack from Higashino, I'm not sure Suikoden would have been the same. There are many people I've spoken with who consider Suikoden 1 a stepping stone to something much greater. 
the essential launching point for the developers that provided the experience necessary to create a true masterpiece. For me though, the first game is something equally cherished, an incredibly strong effort for a first time director who designed a world and cast that was easy to fall in love with and was also able to stand on its own as a unique experience alongside juggernauts like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. Is it on the easy side of the JRPG spectrum? Yes. Is it a bit simplistic in its writing and storytelling? Sure. Does it fall into a few classic fantasy cliches? Definitely. None of these things managed to hold it down though, and like so many of the classic Disney animated films, about which you could probably say similar things, it stands the test of time and proves to be emotionally effective. I would easily consider Suikoden an amazing game in its own right, even as something greater lay on the horizon for Moriyama and his team at Konami. I'd like to thank our patrons who make it possible for me to put this kind of time and effort into these videos. If you appreciate the work that we're doing on the channel, consider heading to our Patreon page by clicking on the icon here on the screen. It's because of the support of the audience that we're able to continue creating these high quality videos.